be about her ankles. And she has a wide base of support, which is basically she spreads her feet up part more than uh, a typical child her age would when she walks. And we see that frequently uh, happen naturally in children who are looking for more stability in they, as they walk. So children who ha are having balance problems. Um, she has a mild forefoot adduction, which meaning her feet are in towing. And um, on her plantar pressures, which I don't know if you can, if, uh, <laughs> see if I can do this. Oh, there we go. Um, you can see that she's weight-bearing um, really on the outside borders of her feet, which, which would be abnormal. And she's uh, starting to have some foot deformity develop. In our second case, this is a six-year-old uh, little girl. And as you can see, her gait is uh, somewhat ataxic. It's not hugely um, widely based but it's not nice and efficient and in a straight pattern. You can also notice if you look closely, she flexes a little more forward at the hips than you would expect um, for a, a six-year-old. So this might be an early start of her um, of crouch. And then also as her feet hit, you can see that she's starting to collapse in at her arch a little bit. So on her plantar pressures, you don't see that as um, clearly. You can still see that she has an arch in her plantar pressures, but, um, but th that this foot deformity is starting to develop. Here she is walking with her little SMAFO um, plastic braces. And you can see she's still a little ataxic, but she looks a little more stable. She's able to, to sort of raise her arms and, and um, is a little bit faster with, with her walking here. Oh, I don't know if I can get, this is supposed to be a side by side. There we go. Yeah, she's stomping a little bit. You're right. So she's getting a little more sensory input when with her, with her braces on. Okay, uh, this is a nine-year-old uh, young lady, and she has a slower gait pattern than you saw in our four, in our six-year-old. Not too much crouch has developed yet, but she really, her foot position is, is very variable. She's got a little bit of bounce at her ankle. I don't know if you can see that. You can, let's see if I can hit play this again. Hmm. Well, anyway. She had a little bit of bounce at her ankle, and that might be some spasticity that's coming out. Um, it would be what I would, would suspect in that. And on physical exam, I would look for something called clonus that, that might be manifesting, that, that is sort of decreasing her stability with her gait. She also has little plastic smafos that she walks with, and here she is walking with those. And you can see it gives her better support at her ankles here. But she still has a little bit of variability in her gait. So here is our, our next case, our fourth case. Um, and this young man is 13. And you can see this is very marked crouch. And in fact, he requires uh, two-person support to, to ambulate get this to loop. There we go. Um, he is very flexed at the hips, very flexed at the knees, and also dorsiflex, so his ankles are excessively flexed, and his feet are collapsed as he walks. So on his formal gait study, and you can actually see this is called a ground reaction force, that, um, that our computer model, when it analyzes the gate for, uh, forms. And you can see this ground reactive force should be right, you know, stable 
through uh, anterior to the knee, and he is posterior to the knee. So he is just collapse, collapsing. He has frequent falls, as you might imagine. And oh, oh. there we go. <laughs> All right, I don't know where my uh, I image went. But anyway, it was recommended after his gait uh, study was performed that he have some surgical interventions. And our gait lab um, is uh, run by an orthopedic surgeon and a physiatrist who, who analyze things. And their recommendations were that he have some bony um, surgeries performed, including a distal femoral extension osteotomy, possible hamstring lengthening, um, to fix that knee flexion contracture, which was fixed, actually. He did not have flexibility there. Um, and address his hamstring tightness. Also, bilateral patellar advancements to try and change the lever arm at the quadriceps and give him more strength uh, or power across his quads. A bilateral psoas release, which is your hip flexor, uh, to try and uh, open up his hip ankle, uh, hip angle through the gait cycle. Um, then, of course, he was also recommended to have physical therapy and um, get a new form of orthotics, which had drop lock, uh, drop locks at the knees. So it would be an orthotic that would come above the knee, stabilize his knee, and give him more um, stability there. Now, I would love to be able to give you a follow-up video after he had all of these interventions. But as you can see, this is a lot that was recommended. And due to a variety of, um, of circumstances, the family actually decided to uh, not move forward with, with further treatment at this time. So we don't uh, have further information. So our next case is a 19-year-old. 19-year-old young man, and as you can see, he's a little more functional than our 13-year-old, but still has marked crouch gait. He's flexed forward at the hips, flexed at the knees, and flexed at those, excessively flexed at those ankles. So um, as, as you can see as he's walking, he was able to walk about 10 meters, uh, the parents said, before really wanting to sit down and not being able to, to go anymore. Uh, he would also have frequent falls a couple times a month. Um, really, they were pretty attentive to, to his fatigue. So here's his uh, forces again behind the knee and his foot deformity um, on, the, on the plantar pressures. And for him, our, our team actually did not make any surgical recommendations. They thought his uh, bony alignment wasn't severe enough to, to warrant big surgeries. But they did recommend a intensive physical therapy strengthening uh, program and different types of braces. Uh, called bilateral ground reaction AFOs. And these are a type of AFOs that actually put, um, put pressure on the anterior part of the shin to give the knee an extension moment, to push that knee backward and help him uh, stand up taller to reduce his crouch. These type of AFOs really only work if you have good flexibility at the knee joint and can get into full extension. Otherwise, they kind of tip you over and aren't tolerated. So moving on to the possible, and I'll talk more about the treatment options um, later on, but uh, possibly possible causes of gait decline, and I feel like this is an area that is really rich for, for more research. The um, direct effects of the SCNA, uh, SCN1A mutation, we know that it causes uh, sodium channel dysfunction and it may affect the GABAergic neurons uh, more predominantly and these are located in the anterior horn and peripheral uh, motor nerve uh, cells causing dysfunction here. And, and these cells are also located in the cerebellum, contributing potentially to the cerebellar dif dysfunction that we see, and then basal ganglia, um, uh, contributing to the basal ganglia dysfunction that we see that, that, um, that really looks, causes these pictures of this poor coordination and poor balance. 
And then the secondary effects, when you have nerves that aren't conducting well, you get associated muscle weakness. And I would love to, to see, is there a consistent pattern of weakness that is developing early on in our, in our patients with Dravet that can be very, that can be characteristic. And when you have muscle weakness in a developing, growing child, that can change the forces that the bones see and potentially change how those bones develop and grow and how joints form. And when you have changes in how the bones and, and joints form and grow, that changes lever arms and changes the physics of how the muscles act on the bones. And so this combination of weak muscles and uh, poor coordination along with inefficient mechanics and, and altered lever arms, does that cause the vicious cycle that we see and the decline that we see in our patients, uh, in, in some of our patients uh, with Dravet? So this is really an area that um, I would love there to be more study in. So functional implications of all this. Uh, crouch gait, um, which I, I feel is where we may have more uh, effect to, to improve upon. It really is an, an inefficient gait pattern. It's very high in energy cost, uh, which we know is already a problem for these kids, and puts a lot of stress on the joints, especially the knees. And that in it of itself makes you want to walk less if your knees hurt and you're tired. So patients above, uh, patients older than 13 years of age really have a much higher incidence of requiring a walker or a wheelchair for longer distance mobility. They may be, may be able to walk a little bit around the house, which is very helpful in, in function, but, um, but for longer, longer mobility in school and in the community, um, they may choose uh, to use assistance. So moving on to treatment options. The different treatment options uh, that are our mainstay are orthotics, physical therapy, spasticity treatments, uh, levodopa medications, and then the multi-level orthopedic surgery, uh, which you got a taste of back in our uh, prior uh, case study. So orthotics uh, in, are basically to support that foot and ankle alignment. They may not be uh, very effective in correcting femoral alignment, but they can help compensate for weakness. So the ground reaction force AFO uh, for um, our last patient, for instance, um, really did, the, the family came back, they got the new orthotics, they did the uh, functional uh, strengthening program with physical therapy. He actually got into a day program as well where he really increased his walking and practiced what he'd learned in physical therapy. And family was delighted. They said that his uh, rate of falling dramatically decreased and he was able to walk three quarters of a mile before getting fatigued. So he, in this one case, uh, study at least, um, we had really nice results and improvement. So, um, so physical therapy I think is also very important for these children. When you have a, a gait um, that is a crouch gait, what we classically understand about that is that these children have weak extensors. So your hip your extensors are in your hip, your glutes um, help extend your hip, and then your gastroc soleus complex and your calf, that really helps um, plantar flex your foot, which then pushes your knee into extension also. So these are important components to work on strengthening. So strengthen those calves, strengthen those glutes, strengthen those hip stabilizers, and that can make an improvement in the gait pattern. Uh, physical therapy also can work on balance, which is very important. Work on gait patterning, uh, which is just those um, those motor plans that that you can reinforce uh, with re with repetition and improve proprioception. Physical therapists have a lot of tricks up their sleeve where they can use joint compression and different weights and different stimulus to help increase your child's awareness of where their body is in space. So medication options, 
when I see patients that do have spasticity, there are different things that I can use that can help smooth that out. Sometimes we use a systemic medication called baclofen. I don't use this uh, super frequently in my Dravet population because in general they tend to be low tone overall. Um, and so I don't tend to reach for systemic medications in low tone um, patients, but it, it can be helpful. Um, baclofen is a, is a GABA analog, actually. And then for focal problematic areas, uh, usually in the calf muscle, um, you can see some, some focal spasticity. I may choose uh, to do some botulinum toxin um, injections, and that does weaken the muscle, however, so I'm always very cognizant of that. When, when I'm deciding about treating for spasticity. You can also manage spasticity with bracing uh, fairly effectively if it's not too strong. So bracing usually is my, is my first go-to for managing this, but in more severe cases, um, these are options. Uh, later, um, as I said, in the older patients, if Parkinsonism has developed, uh, carbidopa levodopa is, is a nice option, and there was a study um, not too long ago showing it was a very small, um, very small study, but it showed that um, at least two patients that opted to move forward with treatment with carbidopa levodopa did have improvement in their Parkinson's <coughs> symptoms um, with this medication. Uh, trihexafenadil, which is Artane, is another uh, Parkinson medication that is available. I tend to not choose this medication um, in Dravet because it can have anticholinergic effects, which can uh, decrease sweating and potentiate overheating, which is a problem, of course, uh, for Dravet. But it is out there, and I suppose in an extreme case, I would consult with uh, Dr. Nupp, and we could discuss it, uh, whether it would be an option. So multi-level orthopedic surgery uh, is, is our last resort, but in patients that have more severe uh, bony abnormalities, this might be um, what, is, what is needed. There is a large menu, as you can see here, of options to intervene. So psoas lengthening, as I mentioned before, would be to uh, physically go in and lengthen those hip flexors if you have contractures there. Hamstring lengthening, if you have uh, hamstring contractures, is a possibility. The gastric soleus actually tends to be overstretched in crouch, and so they might um, actually do a, a shortening procedure of the gastric soleus. Um, a femoral extension osteotomy, if you have knee capsular uh, uh, adhesion and, and you can't actually change the capsule of the knee, sometimes they'll do a femoral extension osteotomy where they actually cut the bone, uh, they cut the femur above the knee and they change the angle there to essentially um, correct that, that flexion contracture. A femoral rotational osteotomy would be where they would cut the bone and rotate the femur so that you didn't have such a, a severe interning. A tibial rotation osteotomy would be cutting the tibia and rotating it back to neutral. And then a patellar advancement is uh, if you have that patella um, creeping up that changes the lever arm of the quadriceps. And so doing a patellar advancement will um, will hopefully improve that force that the quadricep can, can produce to improve uh, upright standing. And then, of course, correction of foot deformity is another option. So in summary, crouch gait pattern is, is very common in adolescents and adults with Dravet syndrome. Uh, ataxia may be present, um, but is not as prevalent in these older uh, in these older patients, and then Parkinsonism may also develop later in life, as we discussed. Uh, crouch gait may be due to a variety of factors, including these abnormal nerve signals, weakness, and uh, bony malalignments. And right now, our treatment options really are derived uh, mostly from CP literature. Um, 
and a combination approach is likely to be best, but I would love to see more research done specifically in our, in our Dravet population. So here are my references for anyone who wants to read up more for themselves. And I wanted to thank Dr. Kelly Knapp for inviting me to speak today and um, helping put together this conference. And then for Alexis Girk, who is the uh, clinical research coordinator down in the Gate Lab. She helped me get the videos that I showed you today. All right.